Pastor Brian Bill had shared an email with me uh, about his younger sister. Uh, she's only recently been going to church and committed her life to Christ. And a beautiful email, a little segment I want to share with you this morning. And this is from his sister, and she wrote, she wrote to him, I never made it through the first Left Behind book. The first hundred pages scared the pants off of me. <laughs> and I got the point quickly. The message came to me loud and clear. I've probably asked the Lord to come into my heart and change my life 50 times. And Pastor Glenn said that asking once would do just fine. <laughs> I do not want to be left behind. I want my son and my husband to grow together with me. I get worried, though, about this change thing because I sort of like my life, but I'm getting the drift and the women in the Bible study are helping me, and honestly, you and Beth have been my inspiration. It has just taken me a while. I was reading those comments really just shortly after I received news from my brother in Phoenix about a dear friend of mine, Mark Woodruff, who was tragically murdered in the driveway of his own home. He had returned from work late that night, was, was his habit, and I've been with Mark a number of times, and I know exactly what was going on in his habit of coming home like this. He would drive up into the driveway, and because he didn't have a garage door opener, he would open the door, he would get out, leave it with the car still running, he would go over and open the garage, lift the garage door up, drive the car in, park the car, turn it off, come back out, shut the garage, lock it, and if you were with him, you were waiting, and they would go in through the front door. Mark never went in to his home through the garage. And so it was easy to get a picture upon hearing this news of what must have happened there. And he had just opened his car door to get out to open his garage when he was shot point blank, close range, twice in his car. His car was left running there with him lifeless inside of it from 1.30 a.m. in the morning until 7 a.m. before neighbors called the police. Mark was such a gentle, spirited person. I met Mark when he was about my age and I was in my 30s. We became quick friends and he taught me how to play golf and he just loved, uh, you know, the relationship that we had uh, was, was kind of, you know, friend, but also kind of father-son mentor relationship. And Mark just was, uh, you know, just that kind of guy that everybody would get along with and love. He also worked for us part-time at the church for about seven years and helping uh, clean the church and do uh, light maintenance work. And it was really tragic to hear that news, but I heard it at the same time, basically, that I was reading Brian's story about his sister. And it was through that lens and that perspective that it brought an eternal perspective into view for me that my friend Mark, though a tragic, senseless death, he was a Christian, and he's now with his Savior. And then the story of Brian, his sister, newborn in the family, life and death, joy and grief. Romans chapter 7, 22-25 out of the King James Version, Paul paints a picture of this joy and grief. He talks about it as he says, For in my inner being I delight, and that's joy, in God's law. But I see another law at work in my members of my body, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within my members. What a wretched man I am, and that's grief. Who will rescue me from this body of death? History tells us that part of the accepted punishment of the day for those who were condemned to death was to take the body of uh, someone who had died, possibly a prisoner, another person who had, had expired or died, and to, to tie that body, that dead body, around the, the person who had been condemned to death. And that the person who had been condemned would die from the contagion of that body that was 
decomposing on them, was wrapped around them. And so the picture of that, as Paul says, who will rescue me from this body of death, is a picture of the great grief that we find in uh, the Nehemiah generation, the joy of what is happening, the raising of the walls, the, the hope of entering into this city in safety and rebuilding what God had always purposed and designed for them and welcoming the Scripture in chapter 8 as we had read last week, the, the fresh Word of God into their lives again and opening their lives to the Lord. And along with that, the grief that comes with the understanding of what a wretched man or woman they are without God. I want to talk to you this morning about the steps that we go through in repentance, but I want to begin by talking about the importance of remembering, and the first thing that we are called to remember out of this passage is God's faithful blessing in your life. Let me read starting at verse 10 in Nehemiah chapter 9. You displayed, they're praying and talking to God, you displayed miraculous signs and wonders against Pharaoh, his officials, and all his people. For you knew how arrogantly they were treating us. They were treating our ancestors, I'm sorry. You have a glorious reputation that has never been forgotten. You divided the sea for the people so that they could walk through on dry land. And when you hurled their enemies into the depths of the sea, they sank like stones beneath the mighty waters. You led our ancestors by a pillar of cloud during the day and a pillar of fire during the night, so that they could find their way. Verse 13, You came down at Mount Sinai and spoke to them from heaven. My first question for you this morning before we launch into the full study here is, does your blessing have a memory? Does your blessings have memory? Once a a memory is created, I was reading a little bit this past week about how our brain works and how memory takes place. And once once a a memory is created, it it has to be stored. And and no matter how briefly, it has to be stored somewhere. There are many experts that think there are three ways that we store memory. First, uh, the sensory stage. That's when we initially come in contact with something that is memorable to us. And and it kind of stands out, and, and then it's, it's, it's on to short-term memory. And then ultimately, for some of our memories, they're stored in, in long-term memory. And because there is no need for us to maintain everything in our brain, the different stages of the human memory function as a, a sort of filter that helps us to protect from a flood of information that we're confronted with on a daily basis. We're told about short-term memory, as I was reading, that After that first flicker, that sensation, uh, that things that are stored in short-term memory, short-term memory has a a fairly limited capacity, and it can hold about seven items for no longer than 20 or 30 seconds time. Makes perfect sense when you think about the last time that you walked uh, over to meet someone, a complete stranger to you, and they introduced themselves. My name is, you know, is, is Bill Smith. And you said, hi, Bill, my name is Alan. And you turn around and you walk away and, uh, and you encounter a person. They go, what's that guy's name that you just met? And you're like, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry, you should have caught me 20 seconds earlier. <laughs> and I'd have been able to maybe tell you. Short-term memory. It just, uh, that flicker, we, it doesn't quite get all the way. And then it's strange sometimes the things that we really do hold on to for a long-term memory. How I can't remember the guy's name I just met. But I still remember uh, my phone number when I was like, you know, eight years old. You know, I, <laughs> I have that in my brain for some reason. You know? <laughs> Four seven three two two one eight. There we go. <laughs> Apparently, you know, when we talk about our how long our blessing memory is, apparently that's not very long. Apparently, a lot of times that gets stuck in short-term memory and is quickly dismissed. It was one of my great frustrations when I first started reading through the Bible as an eighth grader, and I was excited. We had new Bibles. You know, we had worked hard in our Sunday school class to raise the money to go buy Bibles. We did a car wash and bake sales, and, and we all got these Bibles. It was called The Way, the Living Bible, and I had determined I was going to read all the way through that. And one of my great frustrations from the very beginning was reading about how often God's people forgot God's blessings. 
I'm reading along and the, the children are in the wilderness. I think, boy, you know, God brought them across the Red Sea and here they are like, we have no food. Where's the water? You know, where is God? They make a golden calf, you know, right after that. Uh, they had come through the, uh, you know, on dry land as God had parted the waters for them. They said, now this is our God. And you're like, what's wrong with these people? And then as you grow up and, and you start realizing that we are those people, right? We have this short-term memory about blessing. Verse 16 uh, tells us or shows us that but our ancestors were proud and stubborn and they paid no attention to your commands they refused to obey and did not remember underline that and did not remember the miracles that you had done for them instead they became stubborn and appointed a leader to take them back into uh, to their slavery in egypt but you are a God of forgiveness, gracious and merciful, slow to become angry, and rich in unfailing love. You did not abandon them, even when they made an idol shaped like a calf and said, This is your God who brought you out of Egypt. They committed terrible blasphemies. They did not remember. In chapter 8, they experienced the joy of returning to God's Word. And now in chapter 9, they're confronted with their own spiritual condition based on looking into the Word of God. And what God has said, the joy of His Word also exposes the, 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 their own hearts and the darkness of their own heart and their desperate need to change. Their desperate need to allow God to transform their hearts, to live differently. The joy... And the grief, the two sides of that same coin. After that thrilling encounter with God, which causes them to break into celebration, the believers are now come face to face with their own depravity. One of my favorite pulpit preachers wrote this, When we forget God's blessings, we are destined to repeat unproductive and disastrous cycles. When we forget God's blessings... We are destined to repeat unproductive and disastrous cycles. Verse 28 says, But as soon as they were at peace, your people again committed evil in your sight, and once more you let their enemies conquer them. The second thing that we need to do, we need to remember the blessings of God, is to remember how we have turned away from God and the cost of all of that. It goes on to say here that they became proud and obstinate and disobeyed your commands. They did not follow your regulations by which your people will find life if only they obey. They stubbornly turned their backs and they refused to listen. The only behavior that changes is that behavior that is observed behavior. The people took time to, to reflect on God's faithfulness. And then they took time to look at their own rebellious lives. To remember the blessings of God and to weigh them against their own disobedience and, and, and remember how they had turned from God and the consequences of that. We too soon forget the pain of sin and we launch back into activities and behaviors that lead us back to, to roads of destruction. And we're called here as the people were to remember the cost of going against God's commands. The cost of, of being outside of the blessings of God and, and desiring to have our own way and be our own leader. Let's start by talking about the four R's of repentance. The first one is that recognition. The recognition. Verse 36. So now today we are slaves in the land of plenty that you gave our ancestors for their enjoyment. When we take an honest look at our spiritual condition outside of a committed, surrendered life to Jesus Christ, we are slaves to sin. We're slaves to our own lust and desires. We are slaves to the cultural norms, the accepted norms of our society, whatever society is thinking, whatever society is laying down as a policy, we become slaves to that because we don't want to be different or abnormal from everyone else. And so if, if society says that it's, it's, a, it's a good thing for you know, a, a person to end a, a, a pregnancy early if they want to do that, then that becomes the, the belief even in 
church systems, where, where people are, are slaves to cultural norms. Because of our disobedience to God, because we're walking away from Him, those things that are wrong seem right. Slaves to our own understandings, that we make sense out of the things that we see and, and try to, to use our own understanding and say, well, that's, this, is, this is the reason behind this, or this is why leads us to being slaves of, of reason bathed in a sinful perspective. We, just, we, we allow ourselves to, to bring a, a kind of a carnal understanding into the forum where God is, is, is saying to us, here's what I'm doing based on my Word, and we can bring a carnal perspective to it. How many times does God get blamed for choices and decisions? I was talking with someone this past week, we we're talking about the, you know, the the workplace environment, and they were saying, you know, that when people are are disagreeable and they say they want to do something else, you know, that uh, they don't believe that the way that the leader is leading is right, and they they want to go a different way. And they were talking about what consequences are taking place there. And I said, well, you should try it in my arena because when people disagree with a pastor or spiritual leaders and things like that in the church, they often will say, God told me. <laughs> I said, when's, when's the last time you were at work, you know, and, and uh, you're, you're working at Staples, and the guy says, you know, you're, I want you to, like, you know, stock the shelves. He says, well, God told me that I'm supposed to be the assistant manager. <laughs> he says, well, God told me you're fired. <laughs> But it's when, that's, that's exactly what I'm talking about. We're bathing in reason and in understanding our sinful behaviors based on our carnal understanding of what we want, what we desire. There's no humility about it. There's just like God said, you know. I'm like, I just, you know, I'm very careful that what God said, if it's, if it's not coming right out of the book, you know. Very careful what, what I say that I believe God has said to me. Slaves to our own addictions and sin. Slaves to sexual addictions, slaves to, you know, uh, drug addictions or alcohol addictions, all manners of things that we can become slaves to. And it's first of all us recognizing that I led some 12 step programs when we were in Phoenix and it has that beginning of just saying, you know, I'm I, I have to own this. This is my condition. This is where I am. I have to recognize that I'm powerless over what's going on in my life. And that's why I showed up to the meeting. My name is Alan, and I have a problem with whatever. And here I am. Because I recognize that I can't do this on my own. And then the second step for us in the process of an apology to God, which is what repentance is all about, is not an event. Oh, God, I'm sorry. See you later. It's, it, it is a process. And then we work to this point of remorse. And look at... Nehemiah chapter 9, where he says, we, we are slaves here, verse 6, we are slaves here in a good land, verse 7, the lush produce of this land piles up in the hands of kings whom you have set over us because of our sins. Our wealth, the wealth that you've given us, is in the hands of our enemies because we've been in disobedience. And they have power over us and our livestock. We serve them at their pleasure. And we are in great misery. How many today would say, well, thank God that I'm not living in that time, you know, when they had evil kings over them and stuff like that, you know. And I don't have any masters in my life. Master card. <laughs> Master visa. <laughs> Master discoverer. God, I'm not under any kind of slavery. I owe, I owe, so off to work I go. More than a feeling, true remorse is, is a movement towards action. It is, it is more than sorrow. It is regret for how we have turned our back on God and and, and He has given us everything. It's that remembering, that understanding. Look at all the blessings and look what I did with it. Look at how God continued to come after me and, and yet I rejected Him. And then when I got really in difficult times, I called out to Him and He just showed up. He was there. 
He didn't, he didn't say, well, you know, you're going to have to do these five things first. God just, he, he came there and he met me. And he showed that he loved me and he cared about me. That remorse that is moving us in the direction of God again. It says, God, I'm so sorry, I'm weighing these things out. And you've given so much and I've, I've just squandered it. I've not done what is right. And then... The third step is the renouncing. Renouncing is to refuse to recognize or abide by, any, uh, abide by it any longer. Verse 38, it says, The people responded, In view of all of this, we are making a solemn promise and putting it in writing. On this sealed document are the names of our leaders and Levites and priests. My question for you this morning along this line is, is your renouncing visible? Is what you're renouncing visible? Are we, are we able to see that we are truly renouncing those things? I love my wife and you know we uh, have gone through things that every marriage would go through and challenges and I wasn't always the best husband and as a young husband I made some mistakes and I know I did things that probably embarrassed her and you know and and uh, brought you know difficult difficulty to her ma- made it hard for her to love <laughs> had some challenges that I set in in front of our marriage but there were key moments where God really got a hold of me over each issue in my life as I was growing in him and learning in him and, and I came to understand what I did wrong, and I wanted my renouncing to be public. I wanted people to see that I was a changed person. But the language I was using when I was talking to my wife was the soft and gentle and loving language that it should be. That my behavior in front of people and behind closed doors was uh, the same. That I was being loving towards her and and, and lifting her up. And an amazing thing happened, you know, when, when I started really doing that, when I started loving my wife, as the Bible says, as, as, you know, as Christ loved the church, that this, this amazing thing happened. I would be walking through the house, there'd be a women's gathering in, in the kitchen or, you know, somewhere uh, in our home, and I would hear my wife talking about me. And it took me a while to, to really realize that it was me she was talking about because it was so wonderful, you know. It's like this is just these great things that she was saying about the person that I was. And, and I was thinking, you know, in those first five years of marriage or so, I wasn't such a great person. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't as that loving. And now here we are, you know, listening to this. I can't, I can't even recognize the person she's talking about. Is your re- renouncing visible? Can people see that you are really changing, that you are turning, that you are becoming a different person? There's a, there's a lot of talk about this. There's a, you know, how much of this talk moves to, to actions. We've all heard it said. It is, it is not what you say, but what you do that speaks the loudest. And how many of us are, are making that renouncing visible? Listen to Matthew chapter 3, verse 8. Prove by the way you live that you have repented of your sins and turned to God. Don't just say to each other, we're safe for we are the descendants of Abraham, that means nothing. For I tell you, God can create children of Abraham from these very stones. Make your renouncing visible. Let it be seen that you are turning your back on who you used to be, and you're pursuing God with all of your heart. And finally, the last step is return to God. The one understanding that needs to be in all of us is that God never leaves us. He's not the one who's lost. (laughs) We saw that picture last week and how that must have moved the people of that day to to have that reading about how, you know, Adam was hiding in the garden and God's looking for him. Adam, where are you? You know, I know you've sinned. You need to know where you are. Let's get this thing right. I want to walk with you. I want to spend time with you. God never leaves us. We're the ones who leave Him. Spiritual apathy is the beginning of that kind of of, of leaving or walking away from God. Spiritual apathy or a disregard for the things of God, it, it it had produced in its people a willful separation from God. It always starts small. It always starts small. And it began by them saying, well, maybe weekend church is not so important. 
Yeah, maybe small group is not a big deal, you know. Man, I'm getting so busy, you know. Maybe, maybe these things that, you know, um, Bible reading and stuff like that, maybe I could, like, you know, take a few weeks off from that. You know, maybe I could take some time off from praying, you know, in the morning or in the afternoon. You know, not do that so regularly throughout my week. You know, just, just my schedule's gotten huge. And that spiritual apathy is the beginning of this separation from God. It always starts very, very small. With us justifying these things, and then suddenly there, there becomes good reason to do other things and to leave out other things in our life. Our life begins to, you know, you start opening up your schedule and the enemy is going to start filling it. <laughs> He's got plans. He has all kinds of wonderful plans for your life. And a rejection of God's law, His will and purpose for their lives was just ahead of them. And they started with the spiritual apathy. They recognized that in chapter 9, that no shallow repentance is going to lead them back to God. But they had to return on God's terms. It wasn't going to be about just showing up again for some of the spiritual gatherings. It was really going to be about that transformation, that renouncing that's very visible. And it was going to be about going after God in His terms, following His law, doing what God had called them to do and required of them. It was going to be about a, a surrendered life that they must fully Surrender their lives to God. And so we read in Nehemiah chapter 10 and 39 their promise. We promise together not to neglect the temple of our God. We're going to put first things first again and we're going to start living them out. We say a lot that, that God is first, but when it comes to putting the rubber to the road on that, on you know, how does how does that how do our actions show that God is first? There's a there's a lot of incongruity in that in, in, in a lot of our lives. God's first, but, you know, this is important, and we need to do this, and life is short, and so on and so forth. Is God first? Then the world needs to see it in our actions and our behaviors and everything that we do. We need to be showing it. I'm closing, and I want to invite our worship team to come back. I want to read for you a direct quote that I copied down. Uh, before we close, I want to read this to you. It says, I am convinced that the altar call does, no, does more harm than good. The practice of granting people immediate assurance of salvation without taking the time to test the credibility of their profession. Without taking the time to test the credibility of their profession seems unwise at best and scandalous at worst. You know, I really like to say that this quote that I'm reading to you was from an atheist or a quote from a confused Christian. But this quote I just read you is from a pastor. A Christian pastor. He writes, The practice of granting people immediate assurance of salvation without taking the time to test credibility of their profession. I think that um, I'd like to leave the credibility of your profession up to God. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go back to ancient times and say, all right, let's get some water, and if you're a Christian, we're going to throw you in there and you'll float. <laughs> it's not my job to test the credibility of your profession. That's his, between you and him. I'll be able to see it by fruit, the fruit that's going on in your life. I'll be able to see what's happening. All of us can. The whole family of God. We're, we're invited to test fruit. To judge one another's, you know, walk with God based on what's happening with fruit. That's the love, the joy, the peace, the gentleness, long-suffering. You know, those are, those are things of character that are showing that we're connected or we're, non, we're unconnected. I'll be able to, to check on how we're connected uh, as, a, as a body to the head by how passionate we are about what God's passionate about. He's passionate about reaching lost and reaching unreached people. If we have that drive, that desire, that passion, it shows that we're connected to the head. But the credibility of your profession right now in a few moments here, something he looks on the heart. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. A little fearful for pastors who feel that way or think that way. There's something wrong. 
in an intellectual community that would, a theological community that would arrive at a, at a, at a place like that. When I was growing up in the church, our altars were opened up regularly, and um, there was not always a formal call, but they were always open, just come, pray, do whatever. We do the same thing here at Grace. Sometimes there's a formal invitation, depending on the sermon, the leading of the Holy Spirit, that kind of thing. Today I, I feel directed that we should do a formal invitation to, for prayer for those of you who are wanting to walk through the process of repentance, the, the apology to God, the reconnecting with God on His terms, the recognition, the remorse, the renounce, and the return. And I, I want to, as our worship team begins to sing, I want to invite you just to come. Make this an altar here. And let's walk through these steps with God, recognizing that this is a, a process that sometimes we're not always convinced of what needs to happen in our own lives immediately. But as God goes to work on us and begins to show us, He helps our memory. <laughs> Turns that short-term memory into long-term memory. Remember the blessings of God. Remember the faithfulness of God. Remember how He's provided for you and taken care of you. Remember how when you've called on Him, He's shown up. He's always been there. Let's weigh that on how faithful we've been with Him. It's kind of been up and down, hasn't it? Sometimes more down than up. In terms of our life commitment. Does that move you to a remorse, a deep remorse? I missed opportunity. I missed a, a, a potential opportunity to do something great for God and I don't want to miss the next one. God help me. And then remove to a place of renouncing and saying, God, I'm done with this light Christian living. I am committed to You. I'm going to follow You with all of my heart, with all of my strength, with all of my mind. I'm going to give myself completely to You. And finally, to the final place of saying, God, I'm returning to You on Your terms, not mine. I'm going to come after You with all of my heart the way You want me to come after You. And that's the way I'm coming, Lord.